Yeah. Hey, how's it going everyone? This is the Anime Man. When a manga becomes successful or starts to garner some sort of attention from a wider audience, it usually ends up doing one of two things. Either it A, gets adapted into some sort of anime or light novel or some other type of medium, more often than not an anime or even, if we're unfortunate, some kind of live action movie, or B, it never gets adapted into anything and a ton of the people in the manga community start to complain about it and I am one of those people. Now, I and many Anitubers you've probably seen have done countless videos on stuff like the top 10 manga series that deserve an anime adaptation, or the top 10 most underrated anime that would make amazing anime series or amazing live action movies. But in today's video, I'm gonna be doing the literal opposite of that. Because although there are so many incredible manga series that exist in the wide otaku world, and there are so many amazing anime adaptations to counteract that, I don't think that every single manga that exists in the manga world needs to be adapted into an anime. Because truth be told, not every single anime can be adapted into an anime. At least not in a way that will do the original manga justice. I'm looking at you, Berserk. So today, I've decided to gather a collection and talk about 10 amazing manga series that shouldn't get an anime adaptation. Now mind you, as the title of this video suggests, these are 10 amazing manga series, or at least what I personally believe to be 10 amazing manga series. Obviously everyone's manga tastes change, there may be some manga on this list that people are not really that familiar with, or maybe not even that favourable with, but I for one think that these 10 manga series are fucking amazing, and are 10 manga series that no matter how hard we try, unless some kind of miracle occurs, would probably not make great anime series. Obviously it goes without saying that there are plenty of manga series out there that don't deserve an anime adaptation because, well, like, they're kind of just crap to begin with. As they say, a turd with sprinkles is still a turd. If the manga sucks, then most likely the anime is going to suck, although there have been a few exceptions to that rule, fortunately. But these are at least what I consider 10 series that, no matter how hard we try, will probably not make good anime adaptations. The reasons vary in all sorts of ways, so without further ado, let's head into the list, first starting off with... Wait, Joey, you're gonna put a Shonen Jump manga on this list already? And it's not Siren? How fucking dare you? Look, my boys, I love me my Siren too. Don't get me wrong, I'm right there with you with the rage of Siren never getting an anime adaptation, but more so than that, I am just beyond annoyed and a little bit pissed off, I feel, with especially the, the Shonen Jump tards that exist on the internet, of how unfamiliar they are with this particular series, M-Zero. It's simple, even within the Shonen genre from which it stems from, and wasn't exactly the most talked about series, even while it was serialized in Shonen Jump during the mid-2000s. Maybe because it was birthed during a very competitive era of Shonen Jump, who knows. But despite its now cult status in the Shonen manga genre, I feel that there is mainly one reason as to why, no matter how hard we try, we will never properly get a good anime adaptation of M-Zero, and that is Kano Yasuhiro's extremely distinct art style. Now, this is most likely going to be a recurring point throughout a few more series on this list, but in the case with M-Zero, it's the only reason why it can't possibly get a decent anime adaptation. Because the story in itself is simple. It has comedy, action, it even has ecchi and has a solid story and characters that are entertaining all sorts of different ways, but Kano Yasuhiro's art style is so distinctly wavy and warm that no amount of terrible CGI or sakuga could probably do it justice. The way that these characters flow and move to is so unspecified and almost out of this world that it would require a seriously talented director and studio to pull this one off. Even with great choreography and directing, it's still hard to see this show spring to action despite the large amount of action scenes within it. And in all honesty, with how little known this series is to anime fans in the West, I don't see it doing too well in sales either. So with this one, I'm honestly okay with just leaving it within the panels of the page rather than it be brutally murdered by some kind of understaffed anime studio. I absolutely love Kano Yasuhiro's art style and character designs. They're just so cute and so badass looking at the same time. And you know, honestly, I'm okay with the not getting an anime. I'm okay with its kind of underground cult status that it has within the shonen manga 
area. So uh, if you enjoy your Shonen Jump manga and you've never heard of M Zero, what are you doing, boy? Now, I'm sure there are a few of you who are like, yeah, I've at least heard of M-Zero before. I've never read it per se, but I've at least heard of it, you know, floating around the manga world. But concerning this next one on the list, I doubt there are very many people who have even seen what the hell this is. Because while Taizo Motekinga Saga was also serializing during the mid-2000s in the same era as M-Zero, this is probably the most meta shonen jump comedy mangas that have ever existed. And I mean it is even more meta than the king of shonen jump meta comedy, Gintama. Like you thought Gintama had a fuck ton of shonen jump references in it? Taito Motokinga Saga's number of references and how close they are to the original source material kind of almost lies on the infringement of copyright. And that's really the only reason why I can never see this hilariously meta comedy manga get an anime adaptation. The only way I can describe Taizo Motokinga Saga is a Shonen Jump manga for Shonen Jump fans. If you're not savvy with your Shonen Jump stuff, then you most likely won't find any of the jokes in this manga funny in any way. Although the characters and stories prevalent in this episodic comedy manga stand strong just on their own, its charm definitely relies heavily on the referential jokes sprinkled throughout the series. There are even some jokes in here that even I don't understand, and trust me, I've read my fair share of Shonen Jump. In fact, I've actually discovered a number of hidden series because of the jokes in this manga. I just can't imagine an anime studio having to animate 100 different IPs of 100 different referential jokes and possibly face 100 different copyright lawsuits, so I I'm, I'm just not expecting an anime from this anytime soon. But if you do love your referential comedy, especially those that poke fun of the tropes of shonen manga and especially shonen jump characters and IPs, you will absolutely love Taizo Mote King the Saga. I'm just telling you right now, you will never see more JoJo references in a manga than this one. This is the manga that started the JoJo references joke, so yeah, that's I think that's worth mentioning. I'm sure you've heard of people saying within the manga and anime community that manga is not just a comic, it is an art form. And I think Vagabond is probably the closest we will ever get to making that statement a blinding reality. Now, although the contents of the manga are not exactly hard to understand, the characters aren't exactly, you know, non-relatable, or it's not exactly the most fully experimental way of storytelling that we have seen in the manga world, just the sheer god levels of artwork by author Ino Inoue Takehiko is probably going to make an anime adaptation of this almost impossible to top. Although Inoue Takehiko is no stranger to getting his works adapted into anime, one of his most famous manga series, Slam Dunk, became a very successful anime adaptation in the mid-90s, but I feel that fact plays a huge role in why Vagabond won't ever get an anime adaptation. Inoue Takehiko's art style fits more into the realist side of anime art, where character faces, expressions, and proportions look more like real-life humans rather than fictitious characters that clearly only exist in fantasy. This is a style of manga that hasn't seen a whole lot of success in anime, especially in the recent years. While this art style was popular in the mid-80s to mid-90s, going into the 2000s, the general look of manga and anime has slowly started to warp away from realism. Not to say this is a bad thing in any way, I mean, the next manga on this list is a perfect example of how that change in art style is actually a good thing. But if Vagabond manages to get some sort of an adaptation, whether it be anime or something else, I think the best choice for a story like this and for artwork like this would be a live action. Think of every feudal Japan-based movie made by such directors as Kurosawa Akira, or even the huge success of the live action Ruroni Kenshin movies. Samurai series do best in live action, especially if the source material's art style already compensates for that realistic look and feel. I mean, the only 90s realist style manga that has managed to find success in the 21st century is Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, but every other series from that same era has either had their art style changed to fit the new century, or didn't see widespread success despite its high quality. Make Vagabond a Kurosawa Akira styled live action samurai movie and I will be completely okay with that. I will be completely content with calling that the one and only Vagabond adaptation. Otherwise, 
just leave it alone. It's already shining so brightly within the pages of the manga. You know where Takia Score's art style is untouchable and every single anime director, anime producer, anime studio is fully aware of that. So just, just leave it be. It's fucking amazing. Go and read it. If you thought the first manga on this list had warpy and wavy art styles, so much so that it would be really difficult or even impossible to get an anime adaptation of, then Nejimaki Kagyu has no chance in hell. Because the amount of wavy and warpy art styles in this series is evident right from the name of the damn series. But even if you took away all of the spiral motifs away from this narrative, which I don't know why you would, because that's what makes it honestly really interesting and unique, the in author's insane art style would still be basically impossible to adapt into an anime. There's only really one adjective that I can use to describe author Nakayama Atsushi's style. Insane. The way he proportions characters, bends backgrounds to manipulate the character position of the scene, as well as the bizarre use of over-expressionizing emotions in character faces and movements would just never work in animation. Even if you get a really talented director like Masaki Yuasa, who I believe is the master of warping character proportions to make things look really strange and even manipulating camera movements and camera angles to make something look trippy and out of this world, he will take one look at any panel from Nejimaki Kagi and just be like, nah bruh, nah. I I, I ain't doing it. Which is a real shame because at first when reading this manga, it seems like a really bizarre, weird, sometimes gross looking series. But as you continue to read into it, the more these bizarre shapes and movements start to look normal. It's kind of the same feeling I got when I first started reading the Grappler Baki series, but somehow even more proportionally fucked up. And I mean, hey, I was going to add the Baki series into this list a long time ago when I was still conceptualizing this video, but then Netflix proved me wrong by creating an amazing Baki anime adaptation. So hey, we might have a chance with Nejimaki Kagyu as well. Maybe if I'm lucky enough and someone up in the Netflix clouds will hear my voice, they will adapt a Nejimaki Kagyu anime just as good as they did with Baki. Who knows? Only time will tell. There have been a lot of rumors that have been circulating around in the manga anime world, uh, even after all of this time and success, as to why Azuma Kiyohiko's adorable slice of life series, Yotsubato, has still never seen an anime adaptation. One of the biggest rumors that kind of blew up in everybody's faces was the fact that Azuma and the director of his other manga series, Azuma Ngadaya, had kind of ill-intentioned frictions after the release of the anime, and it being not really to Azuma Kiyohiko's expectations. The real reason is a lot more simple than that, luckily, and mainly has to do with the way that the Yotsubato manga is narratively structured. One aspect about this series that differs somewhat to a lot of other slice of life manga is its heavily idiosyncratic storytelling methods. A lot of chapters of the manga start uneventfully and end with little to no expectations, which even for a slice of life series feels quite strange and almost avant-garde at times. I can honestly see where the author is coming from in that aspect. I really don't think that there is any point really to try and adapt something that barely has any animation in the first place within the panels of the manga into something that is on the big screen, i.e. that will be entirely animated. Like, they might as well just make a fucking PowerPoint presentation and call it a day. If you are thinking to go read Yotsubato, or rather anything by author Azuma Kyoko, and are not really into the slice of life genre, I'm gonna stop you right there and saying that you're probably gonna find his stuff boring. And trust me, as much as I love Yotsubato myself, I honestly feel like I would fall asleep trying to watch an anime adaptation of this. I don't see any of these characters and stories springing to life on the big screen anytime soon when they barely spring to life in the pages of a manga, so there you go. Have you ever read a manga and just slowly thought to yourself, how the fuck does anyone draw like this? Like it's a manga that just looks so amazing that you fail to understand how a human hand could have possibly created it. I've had that happen to me a lot of times while reading all sorts of different manga, but definitely the one manga I think of when I think back to an experience like that is Honda Shingo's Hakaiju series. Look, I've read a lot of horror survival manga in the past, but have read nothing that matches up to the sheer terror and awe that the monsters in Hakaiju 
Shu gave me throughout its 21 volume serialization. This manga probably has the most amazing monster designs I have ever seen in manga. They're creepy as hell, disgusting in form, and terrifying in action. Literally every monster from every nightmare that has ever been conceived makes an appearance in Hakaiju. And it's not just the amount of detail in action and art. Much like Vagabond, the character designs fit more into the realism side of manga art, and thus would work a lot better, I feel, in a live action setting rather than an anime. But unlike Vagabond, the monsters in Hakaiju would probably get brutally murdered by the low quality, shitty levels of CGI that the Japanese film industry has to offer. I mean, look at Parasite the Maxim live action. That is a movie that every fan of the Parasite series wants to eradicate from their memories. At least Parasite only had a comparatively small amount of CGI monsters. Hakaiju would be entirely CGI monsters. That sends shivers down my spines just thinking about it. So in saying all of that, I seriously can't see Hakaiju being adapted into a live action, even an anime. I just cannot see it without having to sacrifice the art quality that Honda Shingo offers in the manga. And I mean, hey, it seems to work perfectly in the manga medium anyway, so why try and fix something that isn't broken? Unlike everything else in this manga that at least has some kind of notoriety or infamacy within the manga world, this particular series, or rather this particular author, kind of fits more into the unknown side of the manga world. Because I feel that even some of the most seasoned manga fans on the internet have most likely never heard of Henshin no Nyusu by Miyazaki Natsujike. Now for this particular example, I've used his series Henshin no Nyusu to fit this list, but honestly, anything, any short form or long form manga written by author Miyazaki Natsujike is replaceable with this list. Like anything that he has written fits into this number seven slot. Almost all of his one shot manga have the same exact reasons as to why they will never get an anime adaptation, despite them possibly becoming a lot more popular after the release of this video or some time in the future. And it's the simple fact that every single one of his stories are just too fucking weird. The art style and storytelling methods are on a whole other level of surreal, melancholic, and experimental. Character proportions, reality bending settings, and multi layered dialogue are just some of the few examples of why Miyazaki Natsujike's works are so intriguing, so fascinating, and so not suited for animation. Some people might actually be turned off by this style of manga, so suffice it to say that it won't be a very popular style for anime either. I'd say that the best case scenario if they were to adapt something by Miyazaki Natsujike and to try and maintain his weird art style and storytelling methods would be to, once again, get the man of weird himself, Mr. Masaki Yuasa, to direct it. Because I feel that if there were any directors or anybody within the anime industry that has similar methods of storytelling and similar methods of aesthetics and art style, it would be Masaki Yuasa. Because would I like to see an anime adaptation of anything by Miyazaki Natsujike? Actually, yeah, I think it'd be really interesting. If done right, this could be some of the most interesting anime that will ever be produced and could potentially rebirth the start of experimental anime again. But I'm not counting my coins quite yet. First, Miyazaki Natsujike needs to escape the underground manga scene, so it's still gonna be a little while to say the least. In the meantime though, I'm just gonna wait patiently for uh, Miyazaki Natsujike's next short form manga because I am just in love with this man's weird, wacky, way of storytelling and art style, so yeah, that, it, it has my vote in terms of good shit that you must all read. Moving away from the weird and experimental onto the downright disturbing and creepy is author Oshikiri Densuke's brutal revenge thriller story, Misu Miso. Now when most people think of Oshikiri Densuke, they think of this series right here, High School Girl. A bubbly, cute, and charming comedy series that in 2018 got a pretty decent anime adaptation, which I also quite enjoyed. But Misu Miso is one of the few examples of a manga author exploring genres and exploring storytelling that is really the polar opposite of what they're more comfortable with 
and coming out successful on the other end. Now, I'm fully aware of the fact that Misa Miso is actually a series that is not really favorable by a lot of people, especially those who are more used to the author's comedy style series like High School Girl. But I honestly thought Misa Miso was a really brutal yet powerful and thrilling series that actually played with the author's kind of strange and bubbly art style to its advantages. Because the artwork that accompanies this series is not the serious, realistic style that you usually see in these types of genres. But I do think this cartoony look creates a really interesting juxtaposition to the genre of the story, and creates a deep and interesting contrast that I think further pushes the severity and downright creepiness of the narrative to further reaches. Weirdly enough, I can actually compare this series and similarities to that of of Happy Tree Friends. In the same way that show played with two polar opposites to create a creepy and disturbing experience for every unfortunate soul that found it back in its heyday. And yes, I am fully aware of Misumi Saw getting a live action adaptation a few years after the manga release, but when it comes to an anime adaptation, I just don't think it'll work. The contrast between the extremely cartoonish look of the characters and the brutal violence and dark tone of the narrative would probably scare a lot of anime watchers away. But luckily for all your Skidanskia fans, there is still High School Girl, which, thank God, became a really solid anime adaptation, because I've always wondered if Oskiri Densuke's stuff would ever properly get adapted into an anime with justice to the original manga. At least High School Girl managed to do it, so so if, if, you, if you like your High School Girl, then at least go and watch that. But I mean, hey, with the fact that High School Girl worked, there might also be a chance that Misumiso might work, but it's definitely going to be a little bit more of a challenge than that of High School Girl. While it's a never-ending cycle in the live-action film world, especially in the B-grade independent film world, the concept of zombies in anime is just not really a thing. We've obviously had a lot of examples of zombie-related anime series in the past, but generally all of these series, despite having its cult statuses, have not really done all that well on a grander scale of things. I mean, maybe the one exception to that rule would be Zombieland Saga, which is probably the most recent zombie-based anime adaptation, but even still, it's hard to say if a show like this will be talked about in the next three to five years or so. But unlike all of these other anime adaptations involving zombies that have some kind of twist to the zombie genre, I Am A Hero is a pure zombie manga and nothing else. No ecchi like in High School of the Dead, no cute waifus like in Sankarea, and definitely no freestyle rap scene like in Zombieland, as much as I miss that scene. But what I Am A Hero does have is a brilliant mix of psychology and stillness. There are very few action scenes in the show, as it focuses more on the dark and quiet atmosphere that a zombie apocalypse brings to the world, as well as the looming doom of humanity and the main character as he tries to survive and understand what happened. Not only is the show grounded in reality, making the visuals simple yet clean, but there is little to no dialogue throughout most of the series. I mean, you know you're about to read a minimalistic horror manga when there is no dialogue for the first 13 pages of chapter 1. Not that there's anything wrong with that, of course. I mean, I think it's perfectly acceptable in the world of manga, but as your opener to an anime series, it's definitely not the most suitable series to uh, immediately grab the attention of unknowing viewers. And finally, the last manga on this list that I think every single person watching this video can absolutely agree with me on, and it is... Yeah, you probably saw this coming if you noticed the familiar little bird boy on the thumbnail of this video. Now, for those of you who don't know, Oyasumi Punpun is considered by many to be the Mona Lisa of the underground manga world and is the favorite for a lot of seasoned manga fans out there. Actually, I lied. It's more like the Guernica of the underground manga world because it looks like a beautiful art piece on the outside, but when you uh, dive deep into it, you realize that it's just a, a brutal, bloody battlefield of sheer emotions. And I love it. Now, much like the seventh entry in this list, I'm using Oyasumi Punpun merely as an example of the author's most famous, or in this case, most infamous work, but really anything in Inuyasana's bibliography can perfectly slot into this part of the video. And yes, I'm perfectly aware that there has actually been one adaptation of something by Inuyasana, and that is Soranin, his first debut work that was quickly turned into a live-action movie of the same name, which, weirdly enough, 
was really fucking good. But out of everything Inio Asano has done, Soranin is probably his most lightest work, as the author is most known for his extremely melancholic, extremely dark toned narratives, which I just do not think will work properly and will be translated properly into an anime format. Take for example, Girl on the Shore, a brutal, harsh and graphic commentary on teenage sexuality and maturity. Or what about Deiraku, an almost self-commentary of the author retold in the eyes of a fictional one, meant to represent the real person making the manga itself. That sounds confusing, uh, th that's just how it goes bro. And most especially the titular Oyasumi Punpun. While it is an incredibly brutal yet beautiful piece of social commentary, and, and trust me boy boys, I am planning on doing a whole dedicated video on this series because there is a number of reasons as to why this is my favorite manga series of all time. I just cannot see any part of this manga working in an anime adaptation. One aspect that makes Inio Asana's work stand out so beautifully in the manga world is his intricate exploration of the human personality. While reading through his works, you'll come across every single fictional characteristic you recognize and don't recognize all at the same time. His manga can have vividly realistic moments, all whilst being part of a very unrealistic setting and vice versa. Careful attention to the backgrounds and the flawless compositional techniques he uses to open and close certain noteworthy plot points is what makes Inio Asana such a revolutionary face in the manga world. And honestly, more than anything, I just don't want Inio Asana's name to be tarnished by some kind of mediocre, or worse still, a terrible anime adaptation. I mean, I've interviewed the man himself, and my god, the amount that I look up to him just it sends shivers down my spine, boy. And in the same way, thinking of a terrible adaptation of an Inio Asano manga also sends an equally large shiver down my spine. Because what makes Inio Asano loved by me and so many people in the manga world is the fact that he is purely stuck in the manga industry. He doesn't need any kind of adaptation to expand the universes of his series or to grow his characters or to grow the inside of the mind of Inio Asano through to the readers. He can perfectly do that through the pages of the manga and honestly if he's fucking perfect at doing it in manga just leave it in the manga. And I think really that's the bottom line that I want to express with making this entire video. Just because a manga is good it's okay to leave it at that. In the same way that not every book that is ever read needs a Hollywood adaptation, not every manga needs an anime adaptation. I get some people will say like, oh, I can't be bothered to read manga. I can't be bothered to read something. Watching anime is just so much easier. I totally get that guys, but trust me. There's a reason why I love manga so much more than anime. And I know that's a really fucking blasphemous thing to say, especially coming from a dude called the anime man. But I really just wish every single one of you watching this video will give manga a go, whether it be something on this list or whether it just be a manga you happen to find in the corner of a bookshelf in a library. Just pick it up and give it a go. Reading is not that much harder than watching something and it is a lot of the times a hell of a lot more enjoyable than watching it. Because if you are one of those people who said that they can't be bothered to read manga or watching anime is so much easier or they don't like reading then you're really missing out on some seriously priceless diamonds in the rough. But hey that's just my opinion, that's just my list. And now I want to know what you guys think about it. You can make a video of your own or leave it down in the comments below if you can't be fucked. And for those of you who do want to explore more of the manga world or perhaps for those who have never explored the manga world and would like to get started, then I have the perfect place for you and it is called Bookwalker. They're an authentic Japanese publisher responsible for hundreds of manga and light novels translated all into English for affordable prices and are able to directly support the artists and the industry. If you use my coupon code THEANIMEMAN you can save $5 off your purchase and if you click the link in the description below you can check out my personal list of recommended manga and light novels so why not give them a go? Go to global.bookwalker.jp to check it out for yourself and use my coupon code to support your boy. Or you can go over to my Patreon as well if you would like to support me more directly and speaking of that let's do a special Special thank you to my lovely patrons for this month. Ian Gardner, I created this for Joey and it's very long. Shui Shiro, Merkblor, I, my pronunciation has gotten a little bit better. Blockboy Soma, Shu Rim, NBH Alt Undead, Little Thimble, Hunter Gibbons, Stefan Seiniger, Instagatrix, Crescentia, Steve Lamb, and everybody else on my Patreon who supports me every single month. Hey, there are also a ton of cool other rewards as well, like secret Patreon videos, a podcast that I try and do as often as I can, as well as the script to this very video and a whole lot more, 
all over on my Patreon. So again, if you would like to support your boy and you like this video and you want to see more, then go over to patreon.com slash the anime man and support your boy. Anyways guys, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Like your favorite if you enjoyed, subscribe for more anime banner, keep watching anime. Johnny.